And now for 2148 by Jana Bekovic, part one. Containing her excitement felt like a choker necklace clasped too tightly to allow airflow. The urge to scream at the top of her lungs so that the whole world could hear and look at her with eyes brimming with admiration had never felt so strong. How many girls can boast of having killed a lion and two jaguars? Casting a radiant smile at the handsome flight attendant, she moved toward the seat he pointed to only steps away from the plane door. She was among the last of the passengers to board and was not surprised to see a semi-empty business class. The number of people who sat in the gate area waiting to board had been inordinately small. Normally, she would enjoy that extra space on a flight, but now she craved company as she hungered to talk about her bravery and her growth into someone who, with her hunting skills, could rival both her father and brother. What a delicious anticipation it was to return home and show off her trophies and to look with utter disdain at the boyfriend who left her for a mousy, bespectacled, and flat-chested girl. The plane door closed with a soft thump after boarding was complete, and just as she placed her hunting magazines on the seat next to her, a man appeared out of nowhere. She glanced at him, feeling tempted to request he takes another seat, but changed her mind as she felt a field of energy emanate from him and touch her with pulsating warmth. He was slim and tall, dressed in long-sleeved black turtleneck, and black dress pants, which seemed unusual as the outside temperature was rock-melting hot. His hair was blonde, straight and thick with tinges of blue in it that looked oddly natural. His narrow face and slender stature reminded her of David Bowie. There was something androgynous about him, which, to her surprise, she found appealing. Never before had she found such men attractive. She perceived and interpreted their feminine characteristics and artistic or intellectual looks as signs of physical weakness or a preference for an indoor type of living. What wowed her was the physical strength and fearlessness of big game hunters or the stamina of hockey and football players. Her ex-boyfriend embodied most of those characteristics. She shook her head, still in belief that he would leave a girl like her for a shadow of a woman like his new girlfriend. The man sat beside her, smiled, and said good morning. His accent was unusual. She couldn't place it. There was something warm about him, something so arresting that her curiosity was piqued. Good morning, she responded, as she returned his smile. A lovely day for flying. Were you here on business or pleasure? He adjusted his seat back and fastened his belt. I attended a conference on trophy hunting and other topics related to the treatment of animals. She softened her voice to sound a bit coquettish. Oh, happy to meet a fellow hunter. My name's Sandy. She proffered her hand and noticed that his perfectly manicured nails glistened with the same blue hue of his hair. She thought he might have been afflicted by a skin condition. Nice to meet you, Sandy. My name is Killian. Nice to meet you, too. Hope you didn't spend all your time talking about hunting and that you had a chance to shoot yourself some nice trophies. I killed two jaguars and a lion, and I can't wait to see my dad and brother's reactions when they see the heads. It was too complicated a process to bring back the whole animals. Her voice tinkled with pride and excitement as she gratefully embraced the chance to tell someone of her greatest hunting feat to date. He was listening to her attentively, so she continued bubbling forth. She had always wanted to be a hunter, like the Greek goddess Diana, a girl capable of competing with boys especially with her older brother. She had a strong desire to prove to her dad that girls could be as fierce hunters and superb marksmen as boys. Now, with her trophies in the airplane storage, which she planned to have stuffed and mounted on the wall in one of the many rooms of their large house, she felt she had proven her valor and skill to everyone, including herself. She knew her mother would shudder with revulsion, but secretly she hoped for that reaction. "'So, tell me, what did you kill?' she asked. Her voice quivered with anticipation over having found a kindred spirit on the long flight back home. He gazed directly into her eyes. "'We, I, do not kill.' 
In his reply, she did not detect any other tone but one of neutrality. Oh, so you didn't go on a hunting trip. What was the conference about? Trophy hunting as conservation? My dad paid 50000 for my license to hunt there. The local government will use that money to conserve the animal species we harvest, so it's all for the greater good. She realized she sounded as if she were justifying something when there was no reason for her to be apologetic. If he wants to debate the usefulness of trophy hunting for the local economy, I'm ready to confront his judgment full blast, she thought. However, he did not respond. Instead, he just sat there looking calm and disinterested. Somewhere in the background, the plane engines purred evenly as the aircraft sailed smoothly over the cerulean skies. After about an hour of flying, the flight attendant offered drinks and asked if she had already perused the menu. Sandy looked it over and decided to order the beef tenderloin and requested a glass of champagne prior to dinner. After the flight attendant returned with her snack, she munched on a plate of nuts and sipped pink sparkling wine. But when she looked over at Killian, she noticed he was not drinking or eating anything. She looked at him with wide eyes. Nothing to drink for you? He shook his head. Not at this time. So tell me about the conference. She took another sip of champagne. What's the name of it, and what did you discuss? He responded in a neutral tone. Toward a utopian world was the name, or rather, its umbrella theme. It was a gathering of group of philosophers and historians. One major topic that was discussed in plenary was the mortality versus legality of animal exploitation from a historical perspective. The development of philosophical thought on the subject was a sub-theme, as well as trophy hunting and the evolution of human consciousness. The history of humanity is replete with examples of utterly immoral and yet legal actions that, of course, encompass transgressions against other humans and not only against animals. However, we only looked at the history of crimes and atrocities committed against animals. Sandy felt blood rush to her head. Was he accusing her of being immoral? She wanted to react swiftly, pounding him with arguments proving there wasn't anything immoral about killing animals. After all, they're mere beasts, a lower species without any consciousness. However, his unperturbed effect prevented her from her passionate retort and attempt to highlight the flaws in his reasoning. Obviously, he would argue the immoral side of the argument. Unable to control herself, she responded a bit defensively. What can be immoral about trophy hunting? We pay big bucks to these countries. It's all above board. We don't poach animals. In fact, we keep their numbers in check and we help local governments generate revenue from the hunting tourism. She pushed the flight attendant call button and requested another glass of wine and more nuts. The conversation with Killian was making her nervous and food had always had a calming effect. She glanced at him out of the corner of her eye. Everything about him seemed otherworldly and she could not deny the effect his sheer proximity was having on her. Was it the wine, or could she feel his presence worming itself into her head? She shook her full mane of blonde hair coquettishly, but what would have an almost instantaneous effect on other men elicited no visible response from him. Composing herself, she tried to engage again. So, what arguments did you guys present? I'm really interested in hearing. Feeling annoyed, she playfully tossed her hair again. Why wasn't he responding? She was used to men starting conversations with her and keeping her engaged, flirting with her and pursuing her. After all, not only was she athletic, strong and attractive with her shoulder-length blonde locks and azure blue eyes, she was also a celebrity who'd been featured in hunting magazines several times, boasting trophies such as a deer and a young bear. Her friends, both male and female, were in awe of her. Still maintaining his neutrality, he replied, there was not much of a debate as it was a meeting of like-minded individuals confirming their views. We discussed the long path toward a rise, or rather a shift, in human consciousness that would encompass a dramatically different view of the moral status of animals. So you're a philosopher, she asked, detecting the formality of his speech. A historian interested in the development of human thought and philosophical and ethical positions regarding the treatment of animals. At that moment, a book on his tray table drew Sandy's attention. It was bound in some type of glittering blue cloth. She craned her neck to see the title and read, 
toward a utopian world. She couldn't make out the name of the author, but it looked like it said Killian. Pointing at the book, she asked him whether he was the author, and he confirmed. Her meal arrived, and the flight attendant poured her glass of red wine as she had ordered it. How strange! She noticed Killian did not order anything. Come to think of it, she wasn't even certain if the flight attendant had offered him any beverages. Once again, she attempted to engage him in conversation. So tell me about your discussions. It's always interesting to hear different points of view. He seemed to stare beyond her, focusing on the clouds outside the airplane window. Most discussions include a retrospective overview of the evolution of human consciousness with regard to awarding animals a moral status. She drew her head back and blinked a couple of times. Could you explain that, please? I've never taken any philosophy courses. His voice exuded tranquility without a trace of superiority or superciliousness in his tone. As he was speaking, he was looking her straight in the eyes and it seemed as though their blue gazes fused. The energy field between them rapidly vibrated as a connection between their two minds developed. In her inner dialogue, her thoughts suddenly fell silent as she found herself scrambling to explain her feelings of attraction to this stranger. There was something that went way beyond attraction, as though he was the moon, and she was the tide, unable to resist the pull. His words seeped into her soul, and she shuddered with a shiver of sweetness she had never experienced before. His voice sounded as surreal as the words she was trying to process. Philosophers such as Kant and Descartes did not consider animals equal to humans based on their lack of reasoning power or consciousness. However, they were still against harming animals. Other philosophers of the past believed animals should be awarded the same moral status as humans, independent of their possessing of any special qualities, such as consciousness. John O'Donohue, a Hedgeland philosopher, thought that animals possessed what he called a refined inferiority, a soulfulness of the kind humans could not appreciate. In addition, animal nature has taken many analogies to human nature. Animals give birth, care, and show affection for their young, engage in play, show joy, fear, contentment, misery, suffer, and are driven by the same instinct to live. Not wanting to concede, she shook her head. But animals are inferior in every way. Her voice lost its timbre of confidence, and her thoughts assumed the hue of his, without her being aware of the impact he was having on her. His voice remained gentle and soft in his approach. If humans consider animals inferior, does it still give them the moral right to deprive them of life? Can you imagine a highly superior alien race subjugating humans to their will and considering them as lacking in consciousness and therefore undeserving of a chance of living a full life? Yes, I can imagine that, she said. I've seen enough movies to believe we can't be the only form of life in the universe. He reached out and touched her gently on the shoulder, as if he were imprinting his message on her. Such a superior race might exploit humans for labor, hunt them for fun and pleasure, or even meat, and this alien species might not even be able to recognize any signs of sentience in humans. They might see human actions of engaging in senseless wars, torturing each other and living beings, bombing and polluting the planet, their only home, as signs of a deranged and criminally insane species that needs to be subdued or even exterminated as vermin. And even if such an alien species possessed a highly developed consciousness, they might still be unaware they were inflicting cruelty on humans, a species they'd consider low on the evolution ladder. She raised her eyebrows in disbelief of what she was hearing. But what you're talking about is science fiction. It's not the same. I mean, we've always killed and eaten animals. They're there for us. Yes, I'm against cruelty, and when I hunt, I try to kill them with one bullet. That's why you have good and bad hunters. I take pride in being a good one. She pressed her lips into a thin line and folded her arms across her chest. As the flight attendant cleared away her plates, Sandy glanced at her dessert plate and noticed it was empty. She had been so engrossed in the conversation with Killian that she had no recollection of having eaten her entire meal. It was as though she had been moonstruck. 
If it was even possible for the first time in her life, she was experiencing the phenomenon of love at first sight, something she had never believed in before. Had she ever been truly in love with anyone, she wondered? She had always wanted to prove to her father that she was just as worthy of his love and attention as her brother was. In retrospect, she saw how she had always tried to conquer men, seduce them, make them love her. When the animal trophies in her father's home failed to impress them, she had found it difficult to contain her rage and not call them wimps and losers. Unfortunately, she had bottled up a considerable amount of rage. Rage over her mother leaving them and moving to another city just to get away from a husband whom she had considered a psychopathic killer. She visited her mother from time to time, but never stayed long enough to hear her reasons for abandoning them. What mother abandons her child? She simply could not forgive her such treason. Her mother tried to explain why she could no longer tolerate the emotional abuse she suffered at the hand of Sandy's father, but still decided to wait patiently until she and her brother turned sixteen and eighteen before she mustered up the courage to leave him. She could not endure the sight of the bloodied animals he'd dragged into the house, with his expectation that she'd cook venison for him when all she wanted to do was throw up. Looking at the dead animal's eyes and imagining the slaughtered deer leaving behind a motherless fawn in the woods was too much for her to bear. She experienced bouts of crippling anxiety until she could no longer endure living like that. She told Sandy all of that and more. She said that even though she had never killed an animal and stopped eating meat years ago, she still felt haunted by the spirits of the animals her husband had killed. She would have ended up in a psychiatric ward had she not left and regained her sanity. As much as she tried, her mother's excuses simply did not penetrate Sandy's heart. She lacked the empathy to understand her mother's reasons for leaving them. With the intent of inflicting the same kind of pain she felt her mother inflicted upon her, she took pleasure in telling her mother about the animals she had hunted down, hoping to punish her for having abandoned her children with blood-curdling images and it gave her pleasure to laugh at her mother's pained and horrified expression. Killian's voice startled Sandy out of her painful reverie. A shadow of sadness just veiled your face, he said, with unmistakable compassion in his voice. She wore a look of melancholy in her eyes. I was just thinking of my mother and her revulsion at hunting. I always saw her as weak and such a wrong match for my dad. Again, he lightly placed his hand on her shoulder, Displaying empathy and compassion is not a weakness. Women are supposed to embody sparks of the sacred feminine that nurtures and nourishes life. Women, generally speaking, are more in touch with their emotions and more compassionate toward other sentient beings than men. His manner of speech made her laugh. Men, you talk funny. I've never met anyone like you before. You sound like someone from another planet. Sandy noticed a slight slur in her words. The four glasses of wine left her feeling tipsy. She also noticed how her touching him almost imperceptibly, flirting with him, didn't seem to provoke a response of any kind. So, she continued, what did you conclude about trophy hunting during your conference? Are we hunters some horrible breed of people? He paused for an instant as if in thought and then returned his gaze to her. No, not some horrible breed of people, but people who are unaware. You are unconscious of the animal's plight. Your actions serve the purpose of indulging in your lust to kill in an activity you consider a sport. Your behavior is ruled by unconscious action. She shook her head in disagreement. No, no, it's a perfectly legal activity and one that we pay for. All above board. Like I said, she was surprised his words did not offend her. Slavery was legal for many years. Segregation was legal. Animal cruelty was legal. Stoning women in some countries is still a legal custom. Can you always equate legal with moral? Killian asked. I agree that what you just listed should have never been legal, but society progressed. Precisely. Society evolved in many aspects. However, in this moment in time, there is still a relatively long way to go before it evolves to a stage where animals are awarded full rights as sentient beings. The flight attendant came again, serving snacks, filling the cabin with a waft of freshly baked chocolate cookies. Sandy asked for two cookies with a scoop of vanilla ice cream and a glass of port wine. 
She was aware she shouldn't drink anymore, but alcohol went well with a stimulating conversation with a stranger whose effect on her was hypnotic. Sandy continued, Even though I'm against cruelty, animals should never have full rights. I adore my three dogs. They're like my children. She realized her speech was becoming disjointed and that dogs should not really have a more elevated status than pigs or dolphins. She wondered where that new idea was coming from. She shook her head in an attempt to clear her thoughts. Why do you view dogs as superior to dolphins, for example? Dolphins are highly intelligent, playful, and trainable. The fact that as sea mammals they cannot be kept as human pets should not award them a lesser status. And yet, they get slaughtered mercilessly every year, and the sea is painted red with their blood and suffering. She could not help but stare at him. She was drawn to his eyes, eyes that were sparkling blue and oozing warmth and kindness. His tone, albeit neutral, had an unmistakable tinge of pure empathy. She wondered how he was able to stay so composed and unruffled, almost monotone. She also noticed he was sipping some liquid from a square-shaped teal-colored bag. She was tempted to ask what it was, but changed her mind. She felt drunk and heard herself giggling. God gave humans power to rule over the animals. Her own argument echoed hollow with its weak premise. She could, however, no longer tell if she was drunk on wine or on the proximity of this increasingly more alluring man. Hell, she could even give up hunting for a guy like this, she thought as she giggled again. Killian smiled and said, Don't you feel God in every creature? Animals are as full of God as any other living thing. There is holiness in life a sacred spark that we are not meant to extinguish, if we can avoid it. It's impossible to treat animals the way we treat or are supposed to treat humans. I know humans don't treat each other well, but animals are animals, lower beings, dependent on us. She coughed as some wine went into her windpipe. She laughed again and tried to collect her thoughts as she wanted to sound intelligent and well-read. She also wanted to change topics and ask him questions about his life. Was he married? Where did he live? Could they stay in touch, maybe even get together? She never found such questions difficult to ask before or to make the first move when interested in a guy. However, something was different this time. She could not read his body language, his vibe. There was something about him that was not of this world. To be continued... In the presence of this intriguing stranger, Sandy suddenly felt like crying. She thought of her mother, and images of her dad yelling at her mom and slapping her suddenly flashed across her inner eye, and pain streamed down her face. She was appalled by her show of weakness. It had taken her years to fortify her mental strength, and inexplicably now, all her defenses crumbled like shoddily built walls under the assault of a hurricane. Then she felt his hand on her hair and suddenly stopped crying. The touch was as subtle and soft as a butterfly's wing, but it released a great amount of solace. She could sense his energy infuse every cell of her body, producing a subtle electric shock. Her shaking stopped. His touch was spun from affection and without a hint of sexuality. She could not remember the last time a man touched her like that without wanting anything from her. She dabbed at her tear-streaked cheeks with a tissue. Sorry about this breakdown. I can't explain what's come over me. I boarded the plane happy and proud over the trophies I'm bringing back home. But something has happened to me. You broke through some sort of dam inside of me, and now so much is gushing out. I need time to process my feelings. He smiled at her with compassion. I will leave you now and let you settle down. Since you showed interest in the conference I attended— Perhaps you would like to read one paper that was submitted to it. The book is a collection of all conference submissions. I compiled them. That's why my name is on the cover. I suggest you read this particular contribution. I wrote it. He handed her his book, open in the middle. She turned on the overhead light and started reading. The font on the page increased and decreased in size in a way that made the reading perfectly easy. She ascribed the effect to her inebriation. The words flickered before her eyes and the book felt warm in her hands, radiating an energy that helped her relax. She flipped back a few chapters and noticed that each one had a number in its title. 
It looked as if the numbers may have referred to different years. She went back to the chapter containing the paper Killian wanted her to read. The paper was called 2148 by Killian. There was no last name. After the first two paragraphs, she realized she was reading science fiction and wondered why Killian would submit to a conference something so divorced from reality. He had a truly vivid imagination because his description of an alternate future universe sounded vibrantly credible. She read about the devastating effects of climate change, of hurricanes alternating with infernal fires and floods that wiped out over three-quarters of the Earth's population. She read about famine, wars, scarce resources, extinction of animal and plant species, and shuddered at the vividness of images of sheer terror depicting what the future might look like for their potential future world. Gradually, the hellish images started to pale when she read how the earth was visited by an alien race that came to its rescue. The visitors from a parallel universe had shoulder-length blonde hair with a bluish tinge in it, and the color of their nails matched the blue hair hue. They all looked the same, yet claimed they had multiple genders and other characteristics humans simply could not detect. They called themselves sequions, as they did their homeworld or dimension. At first, the humans, who had survived the apocalyptic consequences of global warming, feared and mistrusted them, but the sequions want but the sequians won their confidence by performing what looked like miracles. From a ring on their fingers, they projected images all over the world, appearing as huge screens hanging in the air. They showed humans their history of greed, criminal behavior, and cruelty, as well as absurdity and brutality of wars and the crimes committed with impunity against other sentient beings. The aliens also told them they had been observing Earth and its inhabitants for close to a century, studying a race so different from their own. They decided to intervene and save the planet, not because of humans, but because of the planet's unique beauty. They brought with them strange-looking machines that could put out fires using some sort of white power. They also brought plant and animal samples they had been harvesting from Earth over many years and planted the seeds in the soil they had first cleaned and enriched to a perfect state of fertility. Under their care, plants and animals that had been extinct for many years began to reproduce and thrive. The message the visitors had for humanity was that a new breed of humans had to be raised if a new Earth were to be created. To accomplish that, Human females had to be impregnated with this species' fertility molecules. They could transfer them to humans by touching their heads. The sensation produced in humans resembled an electricity jolt that coursed through their veins. These jolts were felt every few hours for the first day, and then they disappeared. The humans were so desperate for salvation and so astonished and delighted over the renewal of life on the planet affected by the strangers that they readily agreed. The gestation was only a few weeks long, and babies with blonde, bluish hair and nails began to be born. At the same time, cleanups and rebuilding of cities turned into major efforts, and after only five years, the fruits of joint labor could be reaped. Farms began to yield crops as weather patterns stabilized. But what was most astounding was a complete shift of consciousness under the new leadership. Religion, as it was known up to the 21st century, lost importance as people turned to the spirituality introduced by the Sequions, one ocean, one tribe, one people, one world, hope rises. All over the world, people sat in circles, hypnotized, listening to the thoughts coming from the alien leaders who were rewiring their nature and rewriting their genetic code. What all newborns shared was a collective memory of not only human suffering throughout the centuries, but also of animal suffering and all injustices and crimes committed by humans against their own, other species, and nature. A new moral code was etched in their genes, requiring them to act with compassion and a sense of justice. The human adults followed suit. Under the telepathic thought, influences of the visiting race, both new and old humans, were repulsed and nauseated at the thought of eating animal flesh, and could not grasp that humans in the past ate and killed other sentient beings. Animals that survived extinction were bred and their numbers were reestablished in the rebuilt habitats. Humanity began to revere nature that they had almost lost. Now they worshipped every rock and blade of grass. Prosperity returned. 
The aliens continued to spread the word of all-inclusive compassion, justice, and mutual help. In another 20 years, nature rebounded and cities flourished again. The world was turning into a utopian borderless state where animals enjoyed equal rights as humans and where human and animal food was plant-based. In habitats where predators lived, humans did not interfere into the food chain laws. Sandy closed the book once it started feeling too hot in her hands. What an incredible story! She glanced around looking for Killian, wondering why he hadn't returned to his seat. The fasten your seat belt sign was switched on, and the plane had started to descend, preparing for landing. When the flight attendant walked by her seat, checking if her belt was fastened, Sandy expressed her concern that the passenger next to her had not returned from the lavatory. At least, she'd assumed that's where he went. The flight attendant looked confused and said that no one had been sitting in that seat. She gave her a sympathetic smile and walked away before Sandy could argue. Shaken up by the flight attendant's comment about the empty seat, Sandy opened the book to page one to see the name of the conference and its participants, so she could look it up on the Internet. She saw the publisher's name and year of publication, Utopian Press, published in 2148, a collection of conference papers. She shivered and clutched the book in her hands in disbelief over the experience, not trusting her own senses or memory. The plane landed with a resounding thump. Lurching forward, she dropped the book on the floor, and it slid under the passenger seat in front of her. When the pilot turned off the engines at the gate, she unbuckled her seat belt and bent over to search for the book, but it was nowhere in sight. She stayed on board until the last passenger deplaned, looking for Killian, but he had also vanished. She cast one last look under the seats in front of her, but only found a discarded water bottle and a Kit Kat wrapper. When her luggage arrived and she saw the bag containing the heads of animals she had killed, she felt nauseated. However, she also felt an electricity jolt run through her body. At that precise moment, she knew and smiled at the future.